Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Chris Ruff, Director of the Office for Ministries and Social Concerns, and I'm uh, coming to you from Washington, D.C., uh, where the March for Life will be taking place later today. So it's a very big day for the pro-life movement. We are very privileged to have this morning uh, a speaker by the name of Mrs. Terry Beatley. Uh, Mrs. Beatley is the founder of the Hosea Initiative, which is, does a, a lot of tremendous pro-life work. But really at the heart of Ho the Hosea Initiative is sharing the story, the remarkable story of Dr. Bernard Nathanson. I don't want to take any more of, of Mrs. Beatley's time this morning because time is precious and, and you all are in school. So I'm going to turn it over to her now. Mrs. Beatley. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, present uh, to all the students in uh, the lacrosse diocese, as many uh, who could be here today. Um, looking forward to being able to, if the technology works, we're gonna pan the screen and, and I can see some, some of you in uh, uh, one of the assemblies. But again, my name is Terry Beatley. And today we're gonna be talking about the conversion story of America's abortion king. It's the biggest story you've probably never heard of. And, um, and we're gonna pick it up and start it right from there. It's a story about a doctor. We're gonna be looking at who he was, what he did and who he became and why every American should know this story, all right? Uh, it's a story about propaganda and deception, which has literally affected almost everyone or everyone in the United States. It's affected healthcare, relationships, families, the media, education, law, and politics. It's affected everybody. Um, it's a story about exploitation, and it's also a story about murder. But it doesn't end there. Uh, this doctor's story is also one about humility. Uh, it's a story about honesty. And most importantly, um, his story reflects God's divine mercy. It's almost like the man I'm getting ready to tell you about is the poster child for God's divine mercy. And uh, I'm happy and excited to share this with you. In a way, he's the modern day uh, apostle Saul to Paul. It's one of those stories. It's the story of what happens when we encounter the living God uh, uh, who embraces even the most egregious sinner uh, when that sinner repents. So moving forward, uh, and I also think this story provides supporting evidence, if you will, uh, that what Jesus said and is recorded in John 10.10, 10, that Satan comes to kill, deceive, and destroy. Uh, but Jesus came to give us life, and not just a little bit of life, but life abundant. And uh, so as you learn the story, be thinking about, hmm, John 10.10, 10, Satan comes to kill, deceive and destroy. All right, his name was Dr. Bernard Nathanson. And first I'm gonna explain a little, just a snippet of his business background, and then we'll look at his youth and what happened during college and after he became a doctor and then the impact on the United States and then uh, uh, part of his conversion. So his name was Dr. Bernard Nathanson and just in context, he was born in 1926 and he died not that long ago in the year 2011. He became known as America's abortion king, and he was the medical face, the leader of the pro-abortion movement in the United States. Now, I know, you know, generally, you know, the, what years you were born, and so you were born into an era where abortion was already legal or decriminalized, but there was a time in the United States when it was illegal and there was uh, much greater respect for human life. And um, Dr. Nathanson, he uh, admitted to deceiving the United States Supreme Court, the highest court of our land. Uh, he founded the co-founded an organization called NARAL Pro-Choice America, which we'll go into more detail in just a bit. And this doctor was personally responsible 
for the death of over 75,000 babies and skidding the road, if you will, for the Supreme Court decision of 1973, which we're like, memorializing uh, today at the March for Life, the Roe v. Wade decision. So this doctor was not just one more American abortionist, he was the father of the abortion industry. But let's not start there necessarily. Let's look at his youth. How does somebody grow up to become the doctor once known as America's abortion king? So his youth. Uh, he was, like I said, born 1926 in New York City. Uh, he was born to into a Jewish family. And uh, sadly, um, he was born into a family, a loveless family. His father despised his mother. And, it, and quite frankly, it almost started at the beginning of their marriage and it had to do over a, a dowry issue where uh, the, the, the father was, which was traditional in the Jewish faith and the father, uh, uh, the, the wife's, Dr. Bernard Nathanson's mother, his grandfather never gave the money over to his father. And it created this discord from the very beginning of the marriage. And so Dr. Nathanson reflects in his books and his public speaking, he grew up in a loveless family. He knew not love. He didn't know what it felt like. He didn't know what it looked like between a mother and a father. He did not have any kind of a blueprint for understanding the comfort and the power of love. Let's see, uh, also his father verbally abused his mother and this was on a daily occurrence. Okay, um, be, he would belittle her, embarrass her, and never physical abuse, but it was just verbal abuse and really beating her up to a pulp. His father was also an adulterer, and he taught Dr. Nathanson indirectly uh, the power of manipulation and deceit. So his father was also a, a physician, and back then it was just branching into like specialty areas. And so he primarily uh, helped women in the area of gynecology and obstetrics. So that's, that's his family life. And, and like I said, he was Jewish. So his father put him in the best schools and three times a week he would attend a Jewish school uh, where he would study uh, backwards and forwards the Old Testament, the Torah, and, um, and he learned it. However, when he would return home, his father would mock his, uh, the teaching and um, he would make fun of him. He'd poke at it, he questioned, and he really began to plant all these doubting seeds in Dr. Bernard, in little Bernard Nathanson's mind. So quite frankly, by the time Bernard went off to med school, because he decided to follow in his father's footsteps, uh, Dr. Nathanson was an atheist. In fact, he wrote that uh, he had not a seedling of faith to nurture him. Okay, and it seems so odd to have attended. Um, well, if you think about you attending Catholic schools. Imagine going all those years, and then by the time you go off to college, you have not a seedling of faith to nurture you in this crazy upside down world that right now calls good evil and evil good. Nathanson had nothing to hang on to. Okay, so he goes off to med school and, um, and he's, like I said, he's following his uh, father's footsteps and he's uh, thinking he wants to be an obstetrician gynecologist. And for those of you who may not know what that is, but that's a doctor who specializes in women's health care and um, birthing babies and all the things uh, in prenatal care. Let's see, while he's at college, he meets a young lady named Ruth, a fellow student, and they fall in love. And for the first time in Dr. Nathanson's life, he experiences uh, what love feels like. And, um, and their relationship goes on for a, a, a number of months, you know, probably pushing a year. However, they, they do what they shouldn't have done. They cross the line and they um, got involved in a sexual relationship before marriage and Ruth conceived a child. And um, what should have been, uh, uh, what could have been a happy moment, because keep in mind, they were contemplating marriage, they were talking about it. And, um, but what could have been a happy experience, Dr. Nathanson, as a, as a, a, a med student, 
he's scared to death. He's thinking he's going to get booted out of med school and it would totally change the direction of his life. So instead of protecting Ruth, as you know, God has called men to do, protect women, Dr. Nathanson calls his father and he's like, what do I do? You know, it's looking like Ruth is pregnant. And his father, and keep in mind, this, you know, the grandfather of this, of this baby, the father uh, advises young Bernard um, that he'll give him $500 and he gave him an address and it was to um, uh, have Ruth get into a taxi and go by herself to a doctor who would perform an abortion. Uh, this is indeed what happens. In fact, Dr. Nathanson, um, he did not go with Ruth to this, um, uh, to this doctor. And Ruth was almost uh, four, four and a half months pregnant, almost five months pregnant, and which is considered a late term abortion. And, um, and she almost dies. Um, hours and hours go by and Bernard is waiting out on someplace on the college campus where she was supposed to return in a taxi. And um, what happens is she finally returns. Uh, it's, I think it's nightfall and she's very, very ill. Um, she was hemorrhaging to a certain degree. And so when he's comforting her, um, hugging her, he, he writes in a book later on, that as he reflects back at that time, she must have been wondering in her sobs why he didn't love her enough to welcome their child into the world. So as time goes on and not that much time, they never speak about the abortion, but they grow farther and farther apart. Because keep in mind, going back to John 10.10, 10, Satan comes to kill, deceive, and destroy. And indeed, that relationship, which started so beautifully that they were so happy with, uh, ends up breaking up, and he basically never sees her again. And just so you know, when, when he, he thought of Ruth for the rest of his life, even through different marriages, he always remembered Ruth and what they could have had. So Dr. Nathanson said that this was the beginning of him stepping into the satanic world of abortion. That was his entrant, entry point. Okay, so then he, be, he, he graduates, he does become a doctor. And over the years, he had been seeing in, and he was practicing in New York City, he had seen women coming into uh, the hospital, to the ER room with botched abortions, okay? Um, not thousands of women, but dozens of women, you know, over the years. And um, some women were maimed permanently, you know, some women had died. So this doctor who had not a seedling of faith to nurture him, he looked at the problem of you know unwanted babies well let's just try to get abortion legalized well he really didn't have the backbone if you will um, uh, to launch that movement but interestingly a man by the name of lawrence later invited him over to dinner one night it was a couple's dinner lawrence later and his wife and dr bernard nathanson and his wife and over the dinner table, Lawrence later declares that abortion needs to be legalized. And Dr. Nathanson, he's admiring the boldness of this man named Lawrence later, uh, who, um, who, by the way, had been a very close friend of the founder of what we know today as Planned Parenthood. In fact, he wrote her official uh, biography and so he, so it was as if Margaret Sanger, because she died in 1966, and many of you know the, the organization called Planned Parenthood, um, but she died in 1966, and it was as if she passed her birth control movement baton over to this man, Lawrence, later. And, uh, and then now he's partnering up with Dr. Bernard Nathanson. And if we could have that slide, that at least shows the name of the organization. Back then it was called the National Association for the Repeal of Abortion Law. Uh, today it's called N-A-R-A-L. 
uh, NARAL, NARAL for short. Uh, most everybody's heard of Planned Parenthood, but what most people don't know is that um, before Planned Parenthood ever got into the abortion industry, um, there was this first political, um, it's called a political action uh, organization or a PAC, PAC, Political Action Committee. And this, um, what they're, so they set this organization up back beginning back in the late 1960s with one primary goal. And this is all before the Roe v. Wade decision. One primary goal to try to get abortion decriminalized or legalized in all 50 states. They wanted what they wanted it to be legal. They wanted it to be common. They wanted uh, this um, uh, this surgery, as they just wanted people to think it's just a surgery, um, to um, be just sort of normal, like no big deal. And that was a it's you know if you'd lived back then, it's that would have seemed like an insurmountable feat. Uh, however, uh, with lies and manipulation, you can, you, you know, sadly, they accomplished a lot. So they put together this organization. Dr. Nathanson later would say, we denied what we knew to be true, that abortion kills an existing human being. He went on to say, we did this in order to deceive the American public and the highest courts of our land. So it's quite interesting to be delivering this to you on the day of the March for Life, where the decision that the Supreme Court back in 1973, when they um, uh, opined on this, uh, so much of it is based on deception. Uh, and, and Nathanson admitted to it. So Nathanson became a lobbyist. Um, he was not only uh, flying all over the United States and uh, presenting at, at state uh, general assemblies, state legislatures, uh, really promoting the legalization of abortion, all based on the propaganda, which I'll be going over in just a second. Um, but he was also birthing babies. He was aborting babies. Um, when they finally did get it legalized in the state of New York in uh, April 1970, they they accomplished this, uh, kicking off New York, which was technically, I think it was about the 13th state that legalized abortion, but they made New York the abortion capital of the Western hemisphere, okay? And Nathanson also was the director of the largest abortion facility. We never call them clinics because clinics is where you go to get better, get well. An abortion center, abortion facility, you don't get well and, and usually somebody dies. So he was running the largest abortion facility in the Western hemisphere. Uh, interestingly, the name of it was the Center for Reproduction and Sexual Health, CRASH for short, C-R-A-S-H. And um, while there, Dr. Nathanson, he's personally responsible for the death of 5,000 babies then he trained doctors on another 10,000 babies. And then while he was manager of this facility where they began killing 800 to 900 babies per week, uh, Dr. Nathanson oversaw the management of this facility for another 60,000 um, uh, deaths. So it's a total of 75,000. When I had the opportunity to interview Dr. Nathanson on December 1st, 2009, you know, I asked him, how many babies are you responsible for? Because I wanted to hear it directly from him. And that's how he told me, just like I told you. And then the lies and propaganda skidded the road for the Roe v. Wade decision, which then decriminalized it in all 50 states. So here he is as the um, medical director of NARAL and on the board of directors. He's politically active, trying to get this rammed down uh, and legalized in all 50 states. He's birthing babies, he's aborting babies, he's married, he has a young child, and, um, and he's a very busy man. Well, one of the things that he asked me to teach America is the strategy of how he deceived our country. So if we could have that slide on the eight point strategy and actually the next slide may actually be the baby picture. Let's pull that up so we understand what we're talking about. And I say that because this word um, abortion, 
uh, it's been so watered down. It's, it's just, we kind of lose grasp of what we're talking about. So when Dr. Nathanson and Lawrence Slater, the first state they went after was to try to flip the 140 year old law that protected babies in the womb in New York, in the state of New York. And uh, so keep this in mind, 140 years, abortion had been illegal in the state of New York. And in 18 months using propaganda, Dr. Nathanson, Lauren Slater, and, and they weren't exclusive, but they were certainly the leaders in this. They managed to overturn uh, the, a law that protected the babies through the 24th week of pregnancy. So what does that baby look like? So the baby you're seeing on the screen right now, that's a baby at 24 weeks. This is a baby born prematurely and uh, obviously in an incubator, but we're talking about anybody. You could probably show that picture to a two-year-old and the two-year-old would say, oh, baby, right? We're talking about baby, every organ, every system, a unique individual human being, a, a, a baby, a person who's ensouled, a baby has a soul. They can hear noises, they can feel pain. This is what they legalized up in the state of New York. And I think it's important for you to know now that, that after Roe v. Wade and a, and a complimentary uh, case that was happening at the same time called um, it was Roe v. Wade and Doe, uh, Doe versus Bolton. And when you put those two together, uh, basically it, it allows a woman in the United States of America to be able to abort, kill, her baby for any reason whatsoever, any reason during all nine months of pregnancy. So if you, if you feel like, you know, you've been hearing about this pro-life stuff, you know, for the longest time, it's important to recognize that over 63 million babies just in this country alone have lost their lives and, 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 primarily due to the lies and propaganda that Dr. Bernard Nathanson and what they were able to get away with. So what I want to do now is teach you the eight point strategy that Dr. Nathanson uh, asked me to teach you because at the end of the interview, um, and let me go over that because I may, um, I was going to share it more at the end, but I think right now I can put it more in context and yeah, keep that slide up. And uh, on December 1st, 2009, I flew to New York and to, uh, to interview Dr. Nathanson. I'd written him a letter. Um, all this came about because I'd participated in a prayer vigil at my church. And I was asking the Lord what he wanted me to do with all this uh, research I'd accumulated over the years um, about Planned Parenthood and so much more. And, and I'm fervently asking God, it wasn't just like a little prayer. I'm begging God to, what do you want me to do with all of this? And all I could hear, if you will, that spiritual nudge was go interview Dr. Bernard Nathanson. And I'm sitting in this prayer room and it's hard for me to describe this. I just sit back in the chair and I'm saying, God, why would Dr. Nathanson say yes to my interview request for an interview? And um, and it was just silence. I, I knew I was supposed to at least try. So um, I, I, I found Dr. Nathanson's telephone number, called up to New York, and his wife answered. And I explained what I wanted to come to New York to do. And she said, well, Terry, my husband's 83 years old. He's terminally ill with cancer, and he's, he's very, very frail. Uh, she said, he hasn't granted an interview in over a year. She said, all I can tell you to do is put your request in writing, fax it up here, and I'll present it to my husband. She said, but definitely don't get your hopes up. And I said, okay. So I wrote the letter and I prayed and I prayed over it. And I think probably faxed it up there the next day. And, and she called me back a couple of days later. And she said to her amazement, uh, her husband had said yes. And she asked if I could fly to New York on December 1st, 2009, just like a month later. And um, so at the, so I sit there with Dr. Nathanson, it was just for one hour. And, uh, and, and, and what happened literally changed the trajectory of my life. 
So I like to say, be careful what you ask God for, <laughs> uh, because uh, he might just answer and it might just send you on a trek that you had no idea that you would be on. But I'll tell you what, it's been the most exciting trek of my life. At the end of the interview, I felt such compassion for Dr. Nathanson because um, it, it I, I, I said, Dr. Nathanson, I know you can't get your message out anymore. And I said, but um, if you have a message for America, tell me what it is and I will deliver it across our country until it becomes common knowledge or until Roe v. Wade is overturned. And um, had no idea what he would say. I, I had a feeling he would say, my day is done. You pro-lifers take it from here. I had no idea. But he looked up at me and he said, Yes. And this was the only time during the interview, there was this little twinkle of hope in this old dying man's eyes. And he said, and I, I get choked up even as I tell you this, because um, it is just very, very clear. I can still remember being right there. Um, he said, yes. He said, continue teaching the strategy of how I deceived America. And then it's an eight point strategy, which you're gonna learn right now. And then he said, and then tell America that the co-founder of NARAL says to love one another, abortion is not love. Stop the killing. The world needs more love. And I'm all about love now. His wife was standing right there and I reached over and I shook Dr. Nathanson's hand and I, uh, I said, count it done. I'm going to get the job done. Of course, I had absolutely no idea. Uh, his wife walked me um, and we said our goodbye because uh, physically he could not take any more than an hour of an interview. And I share this little detail just so you know, he, he did suffer from anxiety. And when he would pick up his cup of water, I literally thought the water was going to splash out because he was shaking. And I write about this in my book. It was like, if, if you could grab, if remorse was tangible, I could have grabbed remorse. I could have put it in a, in a bag. I could have felt it. But all I could do is I could just feel it in my being, my heart, my mind. I felt so sorry for this man who had unleashed abortion onto this country. And he so deeply regretted it. So right now I'm going to teach you very quickly the eight point strategy, and then I'm going to tell you ah, the happy, amazing part of his conversion. So very quickly, we're going to run through this. The first thing, um, you know, how do you start this abortion revolution in a nation that primarily had always protected babies in the womb, no matter what the pro-abortion people of the other side of this issue says, we are a nation. We are founded on recognizing the dignity of human life, okay? We're founded on, on a biblical worldview, all right? But that's another uh, day's discussion. The first thing they did, they hired a public relations firm, $7,500, New York City, and the firm uh, said, we have to frame the debate. And we want, they framed the debate around choice, because Americans love choices, right? Think about when you go off to buy your favorite pair of whatever, tennis shoes, favorite pair of jeans. You imagine going into the store and you have just like one or two choices. And you know, we walk into the store today and there are, what is it? 85 different types of shoes. Um, we love choices, right? That's the benefit of being in a free enterprise system. We love choices. So they took that very positive word. They framed the debate around choice. Number two, they crafted the cynical slogans, my body, my choice, every baby a wanted baby. They came up with a list of them and most of these slogans are still being used today. Um, and Nathanson, when I, when I interviewed him, he said, yeah, we sat around this oval table in New York City and we came up with a lot of these slogans and we laughed about them like, oh yeah, that's gonna be a good one. That, that's, that one's gonna work. Very, very you know, cynical. Number three, they manipulated and used the complicit media. Most reporters are lazy. I'm gonna call them spade a spade, okay? He would tell them what he wanted them to believe and they wouldn't go do their research because you gotta understand he was an authority figure, okay? 
These same kind of things are going on today. You put an authority figure in front of uh, the, the TV, right? And people will have a tendency to believe, particularly if there's, you know, doctor before his name. And so he used and manipulated the complicit media. Uh, well, what would he tell them? Uh, he would tell them fabricated facts. And these are really important to know. Because when I learned this, it, it, I remember feeling angry over this, the, recognizing the audacity, the boldness of these lies. He would tell the media, keep in mind, most of the media were young female reporters um, who weren't necessarily grounded in any you know, um, you know, faith. And um, so he would say, look, we have an epidemic on our hands. One million women a year are having back alley abortions. That's an illegal abortion, back alley abortions. And 5,000 to 10,000 women a year are dying. He's like, this is an epidemic. We need to do something about it. The problem with those numbers is they're all lies. So if anybody's taking notes, okay, uh, and, and the real number was never a million illegal abortions. On the high side, it was around 98 to 99,000 illegal abortions. It's still far too many, uh, but it was never a million uh, back alley abortions. The other thing is there were never 5,000 to 10,000 women a year dying. The real number, was on the high side, 200 to 250. And on the lower side, some years is down to single digits or in the twenties. But again, never 5,000 to 10,000. And this isn't me just saying this, Dr. Nathanson wrote about it. And when you go back and you do all the research, the data, the data proves this. So this isn't him just like saying it, but keep in mind, you know, he, he, he's fessing up, you know, in all this writing later on. So we're talking about facts. The next thing is the public relations firm, gotta keep in mind, this is a marketing firm, public relations. They're trying to sell something. They had to sell the idea of legalizing abortion. So the next thing was, they told him you have to have, if you're gonna start a revolution, this abortion revolution, you have to have some polling numbers. Well, when I sat with Dr. Nathanson, I said, where did you get the 60% number? That Because he would quote it back then that 60% of Americans want abortion on demand legalized. He said, Terry, he said, they, the public relations firm told him that if he's going to quote polling, he needed to quote it higher than 50%. Why? Because most people like intuitively, they don't really want to be in a minority. They don't want to be the only one sitting out here thinking, you know, that abortion should be legal, right? So Dr. Nathanson pulled 60% out of thin air. And that's what he did when I sat with him. He said, Terry, I, 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 pulled, I just knew I had to be over 50%. So he chose 60 and he said, I, he clenched his hands. So moving forward, uh, repeated the lies over and over and over. He, of course, he's using the media and we all know that fake news can, is real, and that's what they did. They repeated it. And then lastly, uh, seven, they justified decriminalizing abortion. He would say, look, the women who are going to have abortions, they're going to do it anyway, whether it's legal or illegal. Well, that's a lie right there, because we all know that if you legalize something, uh, more people are going to do it or buy it or whatever. And then number eight, he executed what's called the Catholic strategy. We don't have enough time to get into that, but just know, um, and I, we've written extensively on this, but just know that the Catholic strategy, Nathanson would call the most brilliant political strategy of all time. Because remember, they had to have a political strategy. They had to have abortion legalized and then keep it legal, okay? And uh, one of the primary things was they needed to make sure enough Catholics whether they supported abortion or not, would at least vote for a pro-abortion candidate. So what he said was they had to separate Catholics' religious conviction uh, from their legislative judgment, okay? They had, to, they had to separate them. All right, so moving forward. So that's the eight-point strategy. You are going to receive today this booklet, okay? This booklet right here, make sure you can see that. And um, all your teachers, uh, we have copies, so 2,100 copies up to your school area. And this teaches the eight point strategy of Dr. Bernard Nathanson. I'm gonna open this up. It is super easy to read. We've had thousands of, um, of 
uh, teenagers, young adults read this all over the country. So every page has a picture, graphic on it, big print, tells the story very concisely, and, it, and we go over the eight points, okay? Now, why is this so important? Because if you know just what's in this little booklet, you're going to know more than probably 90, well, based on our statistics, you're going to know more than probably 95% of Americans, because most people have never heard of Dr. Bernard Nathanson, you know, what he did, uh, and then who he became. So after, and I challenge everybody, in fact, we may be able to move forward with some ideas called take the challenge, learning the eight points by memory. If, if I was doing this in front of you, we'd be having a competition, okay? So I encourage y'all maybe class by class, who can remember uh, the eight points, okay, just by memory. I encourage you to do that. But I wanna give you though the blessing, the best part of Dr. Nathanson's story, because it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop with abortion. So what happens very quickly is Dr. Nathanson quits the abortion facility uh, in 1972, we get Roe v. Wade decision January 73. He's celebrating it, okay? But he's now the chief of obstetrics at St. Luke's Hospital in New York City. Don't let the name fool you because they're birthing babies and they're aborting babies at this hospital. But the hospital about six months into 1973 rolls in a brand new technology. And that technology was used on every single one of you. It's called real-time ultrasound, real-time ultrasound. Up to that point, he had only been looking at the baby in the still, real grainy pictures, but now he could see that little baby girl, little baby boy, smiling, wiggling their toes, um, doing all the things babies do in the womb, and he found himself bonding with the baby and, and the mother, and he recognized his second patient, okay? So the father of America's industry of abortion is beginning, he, he could no longer deny what he knew to be true, okay? He recognized the humanity of the baby. And he, uh, his, his wife told me that real-time ultrasound, keep in mind, he was still an atheist at this time, um, that real-time ultrasound, the science of ultrasound, um, convicted him that he had to be intellectually honest with himself, that abortion is murder and that he must stop. It's, it's huge. When I sat beside him, he said, Terry, he said, ultrasound was the real time ultrasound was the bomb. It made everything come alive. And I'll just, I'll never forget that statement. So what do you do? What do you do if you're the father of America's industry of abortion? You've just, you're, you're beginning your pro-life journey. So that was 1973. Ironically, the year we got Roe v. Wade, he's beginning his pro-life journey. And by 1979, just six years later, he was 100% unequivocally pro-life. And he said, he said it, he wrote it. There's no reason why a woman ever has to have an abortion, including medical. Okay. If she's, if she's ill and the, and the baby needs to be removed to save her life, don't abort the baby, try to get the baby out and preserve the baby's life and the mother's life. Okay. So 1984, a few year, more years go by, he's resigned from NARAL. Okay. And in fact, I want to read to you an important quote uh, from him. In his resignation letter to NARAL, this has pretty much never been seen before, uh, other than in my book. He wrote to NARAL Board of Directors, the judgments of the Supreme Court were never meant to be infallible or eternal. And what if we've been wrong? If the court should soon reverse itself in light of changing times and or new scientific evidence, what an incalculable injustice will have been perpetrated. What an immeasurable, irretrievable loss will have been suffered. I can no longer afford these dues, Dr. Bernard Nathanson. So he resigns from NARAL and then um, now it's in the 80s and he doesn't know what to do with his guilt his shame, he's waking up in the middle of the night, 4 a.m. and sweats, and he knows not God, okay? He's trying, he's tried drugs, he's tried therapy, and now he's contemplating suicide. And in 1990, his path crosses with a Catholic priest, 
in New York City. And, the, and, and, and Dr. Nathanson, somewhere along this five-year period of time where Dr. Nathanson and Father C. John McClowski uh, meet pretty much almost every week and they're reading the Catholic Catechism together. He's teaching them all about the faith, about God's love, God's mercy, and somewhere along the line, Dr. Nathanson stops thinking about suicide and he begins thinking about the love and mercy of Jesus Christ. And he, he's and on December 8th, 1996, and this is right after he had gotten his bioethics degree from Vanderbilt University, Dr. Nathanson is baptized at St. Patrick's Cathedral Catholic Church in New York City on December 8, 1996, a feast day of the Immaculate Conception. The, he chose that day purposely. And Dr. Nathanson becomes a, a, a Catholic and a, a child of God. So he's gone from death to light, to, to pro-life, to now life in Christ, okay? A complete and utter conversion, giving proof that Jesus Christ makes all things new. All right, so I want to wrap this up and, uh, and I, want to, I want to challenge everybody. I want to challenge everybody that learn his story, read your fact check booklet. Don't throw that booklet away. I have men across America who keep it in their back pocket. And when they have the opportunity to share it with people, they do. They're using it as a tool to evangelize, to sit down. And we've seen people do a 180 degree turn about their opinion on abortion when they learn this man's story. And so lastly, I, I, I just want to share this, that in Romans 8, 28, uh, the word of God says, and we know that to them that love God, all things work together for good, even to them that are called according to his purpose. God is making beauty out of the ashes of the life of Dr. Bernard Nathanson. And I believe it's as the nation learns, because I promised Dr. Nathanson with your help, we can, we'll teach, we'll teach the country and set this country free, set the captives free. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being hopefully attentive. And I hope uh, that you learned a few things today. God bless you. So I have to shorten myself a little bit here. So thank you so much, uh, Terry Beatley. That was a tremendous story, I, a story that people don't know, powerful. And I really think just to reiterate, it's a story of hope. It's a story of God's mercy. So no matter, I mean, think if, if Dr. Bernard Nathanson could find the mercy of God, we have many women and, and men who've been scarred by abortion, uh, suffered the pain, the agony of remembering. There's healing, there's mercy, there's hope for all of them. And I think Dr. Nathanson's story tells us that very clearly. Um, again, you are getting the fact check booklets handed out to you in all of your classes. Um, I would say, uh, take the opportunity, teachers, uh, religion instructors, if you could have some further discussion, go over some of the things in the fact check booklet, use that as a resource. We have right now a, uh, a, a case before the Supreme Court called the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health. This case before the Supreme Court could overturn Roe v. Wade. Pray for our Supreme Court justices. We've sent to your teachers a resource, a, a, a flyer that has pictures of all of the justices and the encouragement to pray for them. So maybe you uh, teachers can hand those out. You can take them home. You can post them at school. We really need people to be praying for that. I'm going to hold up a, a, a copy of that right here. Uh, so see if you can uh, get your hands on that from your instructors and, and post it and share it. We have the march later on today, within just a couple of hours. Pray for us, those of us who are here that, that, that are going on the march. And there are many thousands from, particularly from close by, because some of the longer trips were canceled for you know, COVID concerns, and we understand that. But pray for us as we walk the streets uh, before our nation's capital, before the Supreme Court, and continue to pray in these coming days. Again, thank you, Mrs. Terry Beatley. Thank you, uh, teachers and school principals, for bringing this into your, to your schools. God bless you all.